Hi everyone and welcome to Miss Estric Biology. In this video we are going through the entire module 3 for OCRA Biology, including exchange services, transport in animals and transport in plants. And it is a big one so if you want to skip ahead to any of those chapters then just click the time codes along the bottom. If you do want any extra support on top of all of these videos for OCRA then I'd highly recommend my OCRA notes and my flashcards. The notes here summarise all the key terms, key marking points to give you a really full understanding and save you loads of time. The flashcards are those are better if you need help remembering the key marking points and getting your head around the key terms to include in the exams. But I'll link them both below and for now let's get into it. So here are the three key sections that this topic is split into and we're going to begin with the exchange surfaces. Now this starts with knowing about the importance of surface area to volume ratio. And exchange surfaces in organisms have many, many similar adaptations. And that is to make sure that substances such as oxygen and carbon dioxide can exchange across the surfaces as efficiently as possible. Small organisms like amoeba, which we have in this diagram here, have a very large surface area compared to their volume. And that means that, first of all, they have a big surface area for the transport of substances but also it means there is a short distance between the outside and the very middle of the organism. And for that reason, they don't require any special adaptation organs or systems for the transport. And instead, simple diffusion is sufficient to meet their metabolic needs. Now, in contrast, large organisms have a smaller surface area compared to their volume. And that means there is a larger distance from the very outside of the organism to the very center. Now, on top of that, larger organisms also have higher metabolic rates, meaning that they will require more oxygen for respiration to be able to create ATP. Also, as we said, they've got a smaller surface area to volume ratio and they have got a longer distance from the outside to the middle of the organism. And therefore, they require adaptations to increase the efficiency of exchange across their surface. And this then takes us into this topic where we start off by looking at the gills in fish, the alveoli in humans and the tracheal system in insects as adaptations. So the running theme throughout this topic is looking at what provides the large surface area, what helps to maintain a concentration gradient, and what reduces the diffusion pathway. So those will be the adaptations that we'll focus on in the fish, the insects, and in the humans. Now in general, to increase the surface area, you're looking for structures where you might have projections. So that's what you see in root hair cells, the long protruding part of the cell. Or it could be folded membranes that also increases the surface area. Concentration gradients, that can be maintained through ventilation or a good blood supply, removing the blood which contains high concentrations of substances. And in fish, we're going to have a look at the countercurrent flow mechanism. And then the length of the diffusion pathway can be reduced mainly by having only a single layer of cells and that layer is normally squamous epithelial cells. So those concepts we're going to have a look at in a bit more detail, starting with the mammalian gas exchange system. And the structures that you need to be familiar with are the trachea, bronchian bronchioles and the alveoli. So let's start with the trachea, also known as the windpipe. And the trachea has these C-shaped rings of cartilage that run all the way down. And that is to support the trachea to make sure that it doesn't stick together and close. So it stays permanently open so air can flow through. It's also lined by epithelial cells which are ciliated and contain goblet cells. Ciliated cells are those hair-like structures that help to sweep away any mucus in the trachea. And goblet cells are the cells that make that mucus. So the mucus is really thick and sticky and therefore any pathogens, dust particles will stick to the mucus. And then the cilia will sweep that mucus up the trachea so it can be coughed out. And therefore it doesn't reach the lungs and cause any potential infections. There's also smooth muscle within the walls of the trachea. And that muscle can contract if there are any harmful substances within the air. And that results in the lumen, so this space in the middle here, of the trachea constricting. That reduces the airflow to the lungs. 
Now, when the smooth muscle relaxes, the lumen dilates, and that stretch and recoil of the lumen is possible because there is also elastic fibers within the tracheal walls. The bronchi and the bronchioles are the next structures that you need to be familiar with. The trachea, which we can see just finishing here, in humans, it then splits into two tubes, which are the bronchi. Singular would be bronchus. And that is to connect to both the right and the left lung. Now, those split even further into these smaller tubes, which are the bronchioles. And at the end of the bronchioles, we then have the alveoli. Both the bronchi and bronchioles also have cartilage within their walls, and that is to provide structural support to keep those tubes open. Lastly, then we get to the alveoli. And as I said, these are located at the end of the bronchioles, and this is the site of gas exchange. Oxygen from the alveoli will diffuse into the blood and will be picked up by the red blood cells. And carbon dioxide within the blood in the capillary is going to diffuse into the alveoli and then be exhaled. So this then brings us to those three features that you always need to comment on in this topic. What provides the large surface area, the short diffusion distance, and what maintains a concentration gradient? The large surface area is provided by the fact there are a very, very large number of alveoli in both set of lungs. So one alveoli doesn't have a large surface area. It's the fact that there are millions of those alveoli. The short diffusion distance is because the alveoli walls and actually the capillary walls as well are both only made up of a single layer of cells. And those are squamous epithelial cells, which means they're long and flat. Lastly, the concentration gradient is maintained because each alveolus is surrounded by a capillary network. So as the oxygen diffuses in, that blood is then carried away and constantly replaced by deoxygenated blood. And in the alveoli, because of ventilation, new air is constantly being brought in and the air that would then be rich in carbon dioxide is removed. And ventilation is the mechanism of breathing and it involves the diaphragm muscle and also the antagonistic interactions between the external and the internal intercostal muscles. And these muscles contracting and relaxing is going to change the volume of the thorax and therefore the pressure. So the whole purpose of ventilation is to maintain the concentration gradient in the alveoli for gas exchange. So when you inhale or inspiration, that is because there is an increase in the volume of the thorax. And that means this space here. So you need to know what causes that increase, and we'll come to that shortly. But the fact that there's an increase in volume means that the pressure will decrease. And because inside of the thorax, there is now a comparatively lower pressure compared to the atmosphere, air flows into the lungs. When you exhale or expiration, there's a decrease in volume of the thorax that increases the air pressure and it forces the air out of the lungs. So the cause of those changes is the different muscles contracting and relaxing. So when you inhale, the diaphragm contracts, that causes it to move down and become flatter. The external intercostal muscles will contract and the internal ones relaxed, and that will pull the rib cage up and out. And that is what provides a larger volume. When you exhale, it's the exact opposite. The diaphragm relaxes and that causes it to dome upwards and the external intercostal muscles will now relax and the internal intercostal muscles contract and that pulls the rib cage inwards and down, reducing the volume of the thorax. So you can actually measure the volume of air inhaled and exhaled using a spirometer. And when you do that, you can get a graph that looks something like this. And this is labeled to show you what all of those peaks and troughs are representing. And we're shown here at the beginning, this is just normal respiration. So we're going to have some normal breathing. Then we have forced respiration, which is referring to a really deep inhale and exhale. And then it's going back to normal. And this bit here on this side is telling you what each peak and trough is showing. So your vital capacity, which we can see is going from this point to this point, that is the maximum volume of air an individual can inhale and exhale during a deep breath. Your tidal volume, 
is the air inhaled and exhaled when you are at rest. The residual volume, which is down here at the bottom, that is the volume of air that always remains in the lungs so that the lungs don't ever fully empty and collapse inwards. And then to work out your breathing rate, you could use this graph to look at the number of breaths per minute. And we could do that by counting repeating patterns. So how many times we've got peaks over a particular period of time. You can also then work out ventilation rate, and that would be your tidal volume times your breathing rate. Oxygen uptake will increase when the ventilation rate increases, and that would happen during exercise, for example. Next, we move on to ventilation and gas exchange in fish, which also count as a large organism. Now, the challenge that fish face in particular is that there is less oxygen dissolved in water than you have oxygen in the atmosphere. So that's going to lead to issues with maintaining the concentration gradient. But first, we're going to have a look at the ventilation in fish. Now, fish swim with their mouth open so that water can flow in and over the gills. And the gills are the site of gas exchange. The fish will lower their buccal cavity, which is within their mouth, open their mouth, and that will increase the entire volume of the buccal cavity. And because there is now a larger volume, the pressure decreases and that's what causes water to flow in. Simultaneously, the operculum valve, which we can see here as closed, is then going to shut and the operculum cavity will therefore expand, which we can see in this section. That will cause an increase in the volume of the operculum cavity and therefore a decrease in pressure. The fish will then raise the floor of their buccal cavity and that then forces the water from the buccal cavity over the gills and then out of the operculum. And at that point, when they've raised the buccal cavity and closed their mouth, the pressure is high and it opens the valve. And that is when the water can then flow over. So this ventilation ensures there is a constant flow of water over the gills for gas exchange. So the gas exchange in the fish happens over the gills. And there are four layers of gills on both sides of their heads. The gills are made up of gill filaments, which are these longer parts sticking out. And then every gill filament is covered in gill lamellae. And if we zoom in here, we can see the gill lamellae are these semicircle structures on top of the gill filaments. So if we think about those three features that we always have to look for, there is a large surface area because there are so many gill filaments which are all covered in gill lamellae. And the gill lamellae is the exact location of gas exchange. The short diffusion distance is because the gill lamellae and filaments are both very, very thin and the gill lamellae contains this network of capillaries. So it's a short diffusion distance. Maintaining the concentration gradient links to the final and the biggest focus, which is the countercurrent flow mechanism. Countercurrent flow mechanism is to compensate for the fact that water has a lower dissolved oxygen concentration compared to the oxygen concentration in the atmosphere. For fish to be able to maintain the concentration gradient for diffusion across the entire lamellae and therefore maximize diffusion, the countercurrent flow mechanism has to be used. And this is when water flows over the gill lamellae in the opposite direction to the flow of the blood in the capillaries. And that's what we can see here in the diagram. We've got in one direction, we've got the flow and then the opposite direction, the other flow. So we would have here, the top one would be representing the water and the bottom one would be representing the blood. And because they're flowing in opposite directions, an equilibrium in the concentration of oxygen is never reached. And that is why diffusion can be maintained along the entire gill lamella. We then move on to gas exchange in insects. And terrestrial insects have a tracheal system, which is made up of spiracles and trachea and tracheals. The spiracles are valve-like structures that run along the side of the abdomen. And they're very much like the stomata in plants. So they can open and close to allow gases to move in and out, but it's also to help prevent water loss. Now those spiracles are attached to trachea and those trachea branch into many, many branching tracheoles 
and the tracheoles are the site of gas exchange in insects. So how then we have the large surface area, the short diffusion distance and the maintained concentration gradient are due to these facts we've got here. So first of all, the insects can contract and relax the muscles they have in their abdomen and this creates this pumping mechanism. So gas gets pumped in and pumped out, a bit like the idea of ventilation. On top of that, the large surface area is maintained by many branching tracheoles. And the fact that there's so many is providing the large surface area. There's a short diffusion distance. Again, because there are so many branching tracheoles, they will reach a really wide distance across the abdomen of the insect. And the wall of the tracheoles are really thin as well. The concentration gradient is maintained by the cells respiring. So they're going to be using up oxygen and producing carbon dioxide, and that is going to create the gradient. But also when the abdominal muscles contract, it pumps new air in and old air with lots of carbon dioxide in out. And when insects are in flight, we get an added effect because the muscles are going to be contracting and relaxing more rapidly, and that will result in them starting to respire anaerobically and producing lactate and that lactate will dissolve to form lactic acid and that will lower the water potential of the cell now this causes water and there is always some residual water within the tracheoles which we call tracheal fluid to move into the abdominal cells by osmosis this decreases the volume of liquid inside of the tracheoles and because now there's less liquid in that same space it causes a decrease in the pressure and therefore air from the outside will move in through the spiracles. 3.12 transport in animals. So we begin this by looking at circulatory systems and each animal has a circulatory system adapted to meet its needs. All circulatory systems will transport gases, nutrients around an organism in a transport liquid, for example the blood, and the liquid is transported around in vessels and there's usually a pump as well to help move that liquid, for example the heart. So we're going to take a look at these four types of circulatory systems, starting with the open compared to the closed. So an open circulatory system is what you'd see in invertebrates like insects. And the transport medium, the hemolymph, is usually pumped directly to the body cavity called the hemocele. And there are very, very few transport vessels. The transport medium is pumped at low pressure and it will transport food and nitrogenous waste, but not gases, which are instead transported via the tracheal system, which we just saw. Once exchange has taken place at the cells and tissues, the transport medium returns to the heart through an open-ended vessel. Now, in contrast, the closed circulatory system, this is what all vertebrates would have and some invertebrates, such as annelid worms. And in this instance, the transport medium is blood and it always remains inside of blood vessels. Gas and small molecules can leave the blood by diffusion or due to high hydrostatic pressure, and that's what we'll look at in tissue fluid formation. The closed circulatory system transports oxygen and carbon dioxide, and the oxygen is usually transported by pigmented protein, for example, hemoglobin. So next, then looking at the single closed versus double closed circulatory systems. In a single circulatory system, this means the blood passes through the heart once per cycle and there is only one circuit that the blood takes. For example, fish have single closed circulatory systems. The blood passes through two sets of capillaries. Immediately after being pumped out of the heart, the blood then flows through capillaries in the gills to become oxygenated. The blood will then flow through capillaries, delivering the blood to the body before returning it back to the heart. This system would not enable efficient gas exchange for mammals, but it does work for fish because they have that countercurrent flow mechanism. So the double closed circulatory system, the blood passes through the heart twice per cycle, and there are two separate circuits that the blood would take. Now we see this in birds and most mammals. And one of the circuits is blood vessels carrying blood from the heart to the lungs for gas exchange. And the second circuit is blood vessels carrying the blood from the heart 
to the rest of the body to deliver oxygen, nutrients, and to collect the waste. So the blood vessels to be aware of then we have in this table, the arteries, arterioles, capillaries, venules, and veins. There's a lot of information on this slide, and what I'd recommend is to pause it at this point, either take a screenshot or copy down this table, read through it in your own time so we can see the different structures that are present, and you've got some explanation as to why it's important. So this would also be really good to turn into a selection of flashcards. So if we have a look at the capillaries first, the capillaries form capillary beds, which is when you have many branch capillaries all connected. And this is typically at exchange surfaces, such as the outside of the alveoli. Capillaries have a really narrow diameter, and that is to slow down the blood flow. And the red blood cells can only just fit through that. And that is so that they end up being squashed against the walls and this maximizes diffusion. Capillaries are also only made up of one single layer in their endothelium. And those are squamous epithelial cells. They're really squashed and flattened. For that property of having only a single layer of cells and the fact that there are small gaps between those cells is what enables tissue fluid to form. Because of those small gaps, liquid and small molecules can be forced out of the capillaries due to high pressure and this then forms tissue fluid and it's called tissue fluid because it's a fluid that ends up surrounding tissues the cells so hydrostatic pressure first of all this is the pressure exerted by a liquid oncotic pressure is the tendency of water to move into the blood by osmosis so tissue fluid formation and reabsorption is all centered around the interaction of hydrostatic and oncotic pressure. So let's look at the formation first of all. So as blood enters the capillaries from the arterioles, which is this end here on the diagram, this is a capillary and there would be an arteriole here where the blood is leading into. The arteriole has a wider diameter compared to the diameter of the capillary and the same volume of blood is therefore being forced into a smaller space. And this results in a high hydrostatic pressure. Now, because the hydrostatic pressure is high at this arterial end of the capillary, it forces out water and small molecules, such as glucose, amino acids, fatty acids, ions, and oxygen. Now, that liquid that is forced out, all of these molecules here, is then called tissue fluid because it is a liquid that is bathing the tissues. And this is actually an advantage because all of those substances that were forced out can then move into the cells if they need it. And any waste products that are made by these cells will move out and can then be picked up and transported away. So the hydrostatic pressure is higher than the oncotic pressure at this arterial end of the capillaries. And that's why the net movement is out of the capillaries and to form the tissue fluid. If we then have a look at the reabsorption of that water, large molecules aren't forced out of the capillaries because they're too big. So things like soluble plasma proteins will remain in the capillaries in the blood, and this will lower the water potential of the blood. So we therefore have a lowered water potential, which means a higher oncotic pressure. And this is moving towards the venule end of the capillaries. And at this point, the hydrostatic pressure has decreased because so much liquid has been forced out. So as a result, there is a net movement of liquid back into the capillaries by osmosis at the venial end. But once equilibrium has been reached in that water potential, because water is moving back in by osmosis, there can be no more water from the tissue fluid being reabsorbed into the blood. And this is why the final parts of the tissue fluid get absorbed into the lymphatic system. And as it moves into the lymphatic system, we then call it lymph. And lymph is very similar to plasma, except it doesn't contain those large plasma proteins and some of the blood cells. Next, we have a look at the mammalian heart. And this is an organ made up of cardiac muscle, and it's responsible for pumping the blood around the body inside of different vessels. The cardiac muscle is myogenic, which means it automatically contracts and relaxes, and it will never fatigue, which is a key difference to skeletal muscles. It has coronary arteries that run on the outside, and these supply the heart muscle, or the cardiac muscle, with oxygenated blood for aerobic respiration. And that then means ATP can be created, 
so that the cardiac muscle can continually contract and relax. Finally, the heart is surrounded by pericardial membranes, and these are inelastic membranes that prevent the heart from filling and swelling with blood. If we go into a little bit more detail then about the internal structures of the heart, the left ventricle has a thicker muscular wall, so it can contract with more force and pump blood at higher pressure. And that is needed so that the blood can flow out of the left ventricle through the aorta and to the rest of the body and it ensures that the blood will reach all of the different blood vessels so that all of the body can receive oxygenated blood. The right ventricle has thinner cardiac muscle in its wall so it has less cardiac muscle and that's because it doesn't need to contract with as much force because the blood has been pumped up and out of the pulmonary arteries to the lungs and the lungs are much closer so it doesn't need that high force. But the other reason is the blood needs to flow through the lungs at lower pressure so that it doesn't cause damage to the capillaries in the lungs by the alveoli and so the blood flows slowly so there's more time for gas exchange. The atria are the two chambers at the top and we can see here that the cardiac muscle is much thinner and that's because they don't need to contract with much force at all because they're pushing the blood from the atria to the ventricles which is very very close and also it's moving down with gravity. So then if we have a look at the cardiac cycle, it can be split into three key stages. Diastole or diastole, depending how you pronounce it, atrial systole or systole, and ventricular systole or systole. Different people pronounce it different ways, but it means the same thing. Atrial systole is when the atria are contracting. Atrial diastole is when the atria are relaxing. Ventricular systole is when the ventricles contract and ventricular diastole is when the ventricles contract. So if we start here on the diagram, at this point we have both the atria and the ventricles relaxing. They're both in diastole. And because those muscles are relaxing, we've got a larger space or larger volume in the chambers Therefore, the pressure drops and the blood is going to flow into the two atria. Now, as the blood flows in, that starts to increase the pressure and it increases the pressure high enough that it will force open the atrioventricular valves. We then get to this stage where the atria contract in atrial systole and that will then cause that contraction and force the blood from the atria into the ventricles. After that point, the atria will then relax and now the ventricles contract. And because the ventricles are now contracting, there is a higher pressure in the ventricles compared to the atria, and that causes the atrioventricular valves to shut. But when the pressure is high enough from that contraction, the semilunar valves will open. And this is what causes the blood to be pushed from the ventricles out of the pulmonary artery and the aorta. So the summary of that key information then we can see on the next few slides. We've got diastole, it's when the muscles are relaxed, the blood will enter the atria via the vena cava and the pulmonary vein. And as that blood starts to move in, it will slightly increase the pressure in the atria. Atrial systole, we have the atria muscles contracting, so the muscular walls contracting, that increases the pressure further, the atrioventricular valves open, and that causes the blood to flow into the ventricles. After a short delay, the ventricles then contract and that increases the pressure beyond that of the atria. So the atrioventricular valves close and the semilunar valves open. Now, this is a key math skill that comes up linked to this topic, cardiac output. And that is the volume of blood which leaves one ventricle in one minute. It can be calculated using the formula heart rate times stroke volume. And the heart rate is how many beats there are per minute. And the stroke volume is the volume of blood that leaves the heart each beat, typically in decimeter cubed. Next, we need to have a look at what is controlling the cardiac cycle. And by that, we mean what is controlling when the atria and the ventricle contract and relax. So first of all, cardiac muscle is myogenic. It contracts on its own accord, but the rate of contraction is controlled by a wave of electrical activity. So the sinoatrial node, or the SAN, this is located in the right atrium and it's known as the pacemaker. And I've shown this here in bright yellow. The atrioventricular node, the AVN, is located near the border of the right and the left ventricle. So just here. 
The bundle of His runs through the septum, which is this section. And then we have the perchyme fibers and those branch into the walls of the ventricles. So these structures are all key in the control of the cardiac cycle. So the first thing that happens is that SAN releases a wave of depolarization across the atria. So that is going to spread from the SAN across the two atria. The AVN releases another wave of depolarization once that first wave reaches it. But there is a non-conductive layer between the atria and the ventricles, and that prevents that wave of depolarization spreading directly down the ventricles. And instead, it forces it to move down the bundle of His, because that is the part that is conductive. And once it moves down the bundle of His, it then moves up through the perchyme fibres. Now, this is an advantage because as a result, it causes the apex, so the very bottom here, of the heart and the walls of the ventricle to contract. And there is a short delay before this happens. And that leaves enough time for the atria to have fully contracted and pumped the blood into the ventricles before the ventricles contract. So it's going to be more efficient way to move the blood out of the heart. The final step we have is the diastole. And this is when repolarization occurs and the cardiac muscle relaxes. The electrocardiogram or ECG is a machine that's able to measure these waves of depolarization. So we can measure it using that ECG and we can interpret it to diagnose any irregularities in heart rhythms. The ECG doesn't directly measure the electrical activity of the heart, but instead the differences in the electrical activity in your skin, which is caused by the electrical activity of the heart. So the way this is done is electrodes are stuck onto the skin and those detect the electrical activity. And you should get a reading that looks something like this. However, sometimes you wouldn't get a reading that looks like that. And here are the four key abnormal heart rhythms that you need to be aware of. Tachycardia, first of all, and that is when the heart is beating over 100 beats per minute. Now that is normal if you're exercising, but if you are at rest, that is abnormally high. Bradycardia is when the heart is beating at less than 60 beats per minute. Now, many athletes do have bradycardia as they are so fit that their cardiac muscle can contract harder and therefore fewer contractions are required. But if the heart rate drops too low, an artificial pacemaker would be needed to help to regulate the heart rate. Fibrillation is when there is an irregular rhythm to the heart. And ectopic heartbeat is when there are additional heartbeats that are not in rhythm. It is actually very common for this to occur once a day, but if it is happening more regularly, it could indicate a serious health condition. We then move on to haemoglobin. And haemoglobins are a group of globular proteins that lots of different organisms have. And this protein is a quaternary structure, meaning it's made up of four polypeptide chains and it's responsible for transporting oxygen. Some organisms also have myoglobin, which is actually only made up of one polypeptide chain, and this is often found in muscle tissues in vertebrates. So an oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve is a way for us to view the percentage saturation of haemoglobin with oxygen, and that's normally shown against different partial pressures of oxygen. So what this graph shows us is, at high partial pressures of oxygen, the haemoglobin is at about 100% saturation, so it is fully loaded with oxygen. However, at low partial pressures of oxygen, we have much lower percentage saturations, and that indicates that oxygen is being unloaded. And this would typically be representing different parts of the body. So you'd have a low partial pressure of oxygen in respiring cells or respiring tissues because they're using up that oxygen. So it is an advantage then that the haemoglobin unloads that oxygen and therefore it becomes less saturated because the oxygen can be used in respiration. And in the alveoli where there's a really high partial pressure of oxygen, you have a high saturation. 
So where there's lots of oxygen available, the haemoglobin will load on lots to then transport it around. So this graph is showing us changes in affinity and affinity is referring to the attraction. So at high partial pressures of oxygen, haemoglobin has a high affinity for oxygen. At low partial pressures of oxygen, haemoglobin has a lower affinity. This also links to the concept of cooperative binding. And this cooperative nature of oxygen binding to haemoglobin is due to the haemoglobin changing shape. So we can see here that when first oxygen must be binding, it must be harder because we have got a less steep curve on the graph. But when that first oxygen binds, it actually causes the shape of that protein, the haemoglobin, to change and it exposes the further binding sites of oxygen more. And that's why the curve is much steeper at this point. It's easier for the second and the third oxygens to bind. It then starts to level off because we now only have one binding site of the four remaining. So again, that reduces the likelihood of it binding because you've only got a one in four chance of colliding at the right position. The Bohr effect is when high carbon dioxide concentration causes the oxyhemoglobin curve to shift to the right. So we've got here pH 7.6, but then if we decrease the pH to 7.4 or decrease it further to 7.2, each time that curve has shifted to the right. And this indicates that the affinity that haemoglobin has for oxygen is decreasing. And we can tell that because if we have a look at the same partial pressure, but compare the two curves, for the top one, at a low partial pressure of carbon dioxide, which is indicated by the pH, the curve is further to the left, we have a higher affinity and therefore more oxygen is loaded. But at that same partial pressure of oxygen, but with a lower pH, which would indicate there must be more carbon dioxide present because that is what affects the pH, the curve has shifted to the right. And that means that even at the same partial pressure of oxygen, far less oxygen is bound. So it must be unloading more oxygen. And this is an advantage because if you have high levels of carbon dioxide, it indicates it's the site of respiration. So if you're unloading oxygen at that location, there will be a constant supply of oxygen for aerobic respiration to continue. You might also be asked to compare the haemoglobins of different organisms and link it to their environments. So we're going to have a look at these four. We're starting with a human fetus. And these different labels that we have are, first of all, HBA means adult haemoglobin. HBF means fetal haemoglobin. And then we've got myoglobin, which is a different type of protein altogether. So we're just going to focus on the blue and the green line. Fetal haemoglobin, which is the haemoglobin that a fetus has, the curve has shifted to the left. And that tells us that even at the same partial pressure of oxygen, it is more saturated with oxygen, the haemoglobin is. So it must have a higher affinity. And that's beneficial because the fetus has to be able to get oxygen from the mother's haemoglobin. So it's an advantage that the fetus's haemoglobin has a higher affinity than the adult haemoglobin because it's able to then remove oxygen from the haemoglobin of an adult and it will bind to the fetus's haemoglobin instead. Llamas live at very high altitudes. So they also have a higher affinity. So their haemoglobin has a higher affinity for oxygen. So even though they are in environments with a lower partial pressure, their haemoglobin can still load up oxygen and become saturated. The haemoglobin of a dove has a lower affinity for oxygen. And we can see that because the curve has shifted to the right. So even at the same partial pressure, it is less saturated, meaning that more oxygen must have been unloaded. And this is an advantage because animals like doves, which have faster metabolisms, will require more oxygen for respiration to be able to provide the energy for the muscle contraction. Lastly, then we have the earthworm and earthworms are typically underground where there is a lower partial pressure of oxygen. So they need to be able to load oxygen onto the haemoglobin, even though they are in an environment with a low partial pressure. So it's an advantage to them that their haemoglobin has 
a higher affinity for oxygen. Lastly, it's looking at how carbon dioxide can be transported. And there are three key ways. It could be dissolved in the blood plasma as hemoglobinic acid, or the carbon dioxide could react with amino acids in the hemoglobin to form hemoglobinic acid. Lastly, it could be in the cytoplasm of red blood cells in the form of hydrogen carbonate ions. Now, almost 85% of carbon dioxide is transported as hydrogen carbonate ions in red blood cells. Water and carbon dioxide react in a reversible reaction to form hydrogen ions and hydrogen carbonate ions. Carbonic anhydrase, an enzyme in the cytoplasm of red blood cells, catalyzes that reaction. That carbonic acid can diffuse out of the red blood cells and exchange chloride ions diffuse into the red blood cells. Both of these ions are negative, so this exchange maintains the electrical balance of red blood cells, known as the chloride shift. 3.13 Transport in plants. So the main substances transported en masse in plants are water and organic substances meaning anything containing carbon, which is going to be the products of photosynthesis. These are transported either by the xylem or the phloem, which collectively are described as the vascular bundle. So we're going to start by looking at the structure of the xylem and the phloem. The phloem tissue is made up of two key cells. We have the sieve tube elements, and then next to those are the companion cells. The sieve tube elements are living cells, but they contain no nucleus, very few organelles, and they have got these perforated end walls. And this is to assist in the mass transport of fluids. Because they are lacking lots of organelles though, they are dependent on the companion cells, which are next to them, to provide the ATP required for active transport of the organic substances into that sieve tube element. Xylem cells, on the other hand, are dead cells, and they are also hollow. And here we're looking at a cross section through a xylem in a very thin slice under the microscope. They do not contain any organelles or end walls. And as a result, they stack up on each other to create a continuous hollow column, much like a hose pipe, ideal for transporting water and mineral ions. The xylem wall is also strengthened with a waterproof chemical called lignin. So if we have a look at the transport of water, the first thing is knowing the transport of water into the plants. Now this happens from the soil into the root hair cells and the water is absorbed by osmosis. Root hair cells are adapted to maximize absorption by osmosis by having very thin walls to reduce that diffusion pathway and also they have those long protrusions providing a large surface area. Once that water is then inside of the root hair cells, it needs to move from that root hair cell to the xylem to be moved en masse. And that can either be through the symplast or apoplast pathway. The symplast pathway is when the water moves through the cytoplasm of a cell. The water will move from cell to cell towards the xylem, by osmosis through the cytoplasm, and also through gaps in each cell wall, which is called a plasmodesmata. Each successive cell cytoplasm has a lower water potential, and this is why the water is able to continually move from cell to cell towards the xylem by osmosis. The apoplast pathway is when the water moves through the cell walls. Water can enter the cell wall and move due to cohesive forces. The water molecules stick together because of the hydrogen bonding, and they form a continuous stream of water, which move towards the xylem. This pathway transports water much faster as there is little resistance to the water in the cell wall. The adaptations that some plants have to either very, very high or low quantities of water are also required. So in plants, gas exchange happens through the stomata, and stomata are tiny pores, mainly on the lower sides of the leaves. And these can open and close, which is determined by guard cells. And this opening and closing is a mechanism to try and prevent excessive water loss by evaporation. Xerophytes are extreme files which have adaptations to reduce water loss and are therefore found in environments with limited water, for example, the desert. Or marron grass, which is also an example of a xerophyte, is found on the sand dunes. And despite it being next to the ocean, there is still limited water due to the sand being so porous. So if we have a look at some of the adaptations that marron grass, an example of a xerophyte, has. First of all, we've got these curled leaves and that traps moisture 
and therefore it increases the humidity within this space. Because there's an increased humidity, that decreases the water potential gradient and it reduces evaporation. So we can see that we've got not only the curls, but there are also these hair-like structures, which would also trap that moist air and increase the humidity. The stomata are sunken in, and that again increases the local humidity to reduce the water potential gradient. On the outside, there is also a thicker cuticle to reduce the water loss by evaporation. In addition to this, to help gain more water, it will have a longer root network so that there is more reach to be able to absorb more water by osmosis. Hydrophytes are the opposites. These are plants which live in or on water, so they require adaptations to survive in an excess of water. Water lilies are an example of hydrophytes which grow on the surface of water. The adaptations include short roots, very thin to no waxy cuticle, and stomata being permanently open and on the top surface of the leaf. These adaptations assure that no additional water is retained in the plant and efficient water loss occurs. Adaptations to ensure enough light is still absorbed for photosynthesis include the leaves being really, really large and wide on the surface of the water. So next then we're looking at what is transpiration. And this is when water vapour is lost from a leaf via the stomata. So it's the evaporation of water vapour from the stomata. And you need to know about the different conditions that will affect the rate of transpiration. We can have a look at those different conditions, but be aware as well that to measure these changes in rate, you would need to use a piece of apparatus called a potometer. So here are four key factors that affect the rate of transpiration. With a higher light intensity, the light will cause the stomata to open more. Therefore, there's a larger surface area for evaporation. With a higher temperature, the water molecules will gain kinetic energy, move faster, and therefore there'd be increased evaporation. There is a negative correlation between the effect of humidity and the rate. The more water vapour in the air, so the more humid the air, that will make the water potential more positive outside of the leaf, and it therefore reduces the water potential gradient and transpiration. There's a positive correlation with wind, meaning the more windy it is, it will blow away the humid air containing that water vapour, and that will help to maintain the water potential gradient and increase transpiration. This leads into looking at the water of movement up the xylem. So water moves up a plant from the roots against gravity, and in the case of trees, that could be several metres against gravity. And this is only possible because of the cohesion tension theory. And this is split into a few different concepts to be aware of. Cohesion of water, capillarity or adhesion of water and root pressure. So if we start with cohesion, this links back to the properties of water being polar or dipolar, meaning that we've got these two different charged regions. And because of those different charged regions, hydrogen bonds can form between the hydrogen and the oxygen of different water molecules. And that's what these dashed lines are showing. Those water molecules sticking together or cohesing is what creates this continuous column of water in the xylem. Adhesion of water is when water is sticking to other molecules. So water can adhere to the walls of the xylem, for example. Now it's not actually shown in the middle here, but you would have a continuous column of water attached to each other, but also to the walls of the xylem. In this image, I'm just emphasizing that it does attach to the xylem walls to really show this impact. And the narrower the xylem, that would mean the larger surface area in contact with the water and therefore stronger adhesion. So we'll actually see this happen in our cohesion tension theory. But as transpiration increases, it can actually cause the xylem to become narrower. And as it gets narrower, that increases adhesion. So we'll come back to that concept. The final thing to consider is root pressure. And this is as water moves into the roots by osmosis, you're increasing the volume of liquid in that space, and that will increase the pressure. Because the pressure is quite high in the roots, it pushes up all of the water above it, so we have this upwards or positive pressure. So we need to look at how these three concepts link together to result in cohesion tension theory, which is what causes water to move up the xylem.
So the first thing that happens is water will evaporate out of the stomata of the leaves. And as water is being removed, there'll be a lower volume of liquid in the leaves and that causes the pressure to decrease. Because the pressure decreases, water will move in to fill its space. So more water is then pulled up the xylem to replace it because of that negative pressure. Now this water is all stuck together due to the hydrogen bonds, so they are cohesive. And we have this continuous column of water being pulled up the xylem, replacing the water as it transpires. But because the water molecules are also stuck or adhering to the walls of the xylem, as the water column is being pulled up and the water is stuck to the walls of the xylem, it pulls the water column upwards and the walls of the xylem inwards. And that makes the walls of the xylem closer together and therefore the lumen is narrower. So it's this tension of the water being pulled upwards in that continuous column that pulls the xylem to be narrower. Now, because it's narrower, that adhesion will have a bigger impact. And we've also got the root pressure pushing the water up. And those three properties together are what ensure we get this continuous column of water moving up the xylem against gravity. The second type of transport is the transport of the organic substances produced in photosynthesis. So that is what we're going to be looking at, how those organic substances are transported around the plant through the phloem. So we've already had a look at the structure of the phloem, and this then leads us into translocation. And this is the transport of organic substances in plants. And this process requires energy. It's an active process. It revolves around this idea that we have the mass flow from the source, and the source is where the organic substance is made, so in photosynthesizing cells. And we have the mass flow from that source to the sink. And the sink is the site where the organic substances are going to be used in respiration. So you can look at this model here, the source to sink explanation. It's a very simplified version, but it demonstrates what is happening. We've got our source cell, which we said is the photosynthesizing cell. And that will be connected via the phloem to a sink cell, which is a respiring cell. And we have the xylem next to the phloem in the vascular bundle. But to help represent this, we're just saying it's in a tank of water. So when that cell is photosynthesizing, we're going to be producing sucrose, which lowers the water potential of the cell. Therefore, water would move from the xylem into that cell. At the other end, the respiring cell is using up sucrose and therefore it has a more positive water potential compared to the surroundings and water would leave the sink cell by osmosis. So what that does to the hydrostatic pressure is at the source cell where water is moving in, the hydrostatic pressure will increase and at the sink cell where water is moving out, the hydrostatic pressure would decrease. So as a result, the source cell has a comparatively higher hydrostatic pressure than the sink cell so the liquids within those cells are forced through the phloem towards the sink cell. Now, looking at a bit more detail of what is actually going on takes us into the next stages of translocation. So we've already said that the photosynthesizing cell is the source cell. And at that point, organic substances are being created by photosynthesis, for example, sucrose. And that's what's shown in this image in the red. So those red circles are sucrose. We have a high concentration of sucrose at the site of production for photosynthesis. Therefore, the sucrose diffuses down its concentration gradient into the companion cell via facilitated diffusion. Now, at this point, we have the active co-transport. And different textbooks will go into this in different levels of detail. Sometimes it's sufficient just to say that the sucrose is actively or co-transported from the source cell into the sieve tube element, but other sources will go into this level of detail um, where it tells you that there's an active transport of hydrogen ions from the companion cell into these spaces within the cell walls. And this uses energy because it's active transport. It creates a concentration gradient and therefore the hydrogen ions move down their concentration gradient via carrier proteins into the sieve tube element. Now, the co-transport is 
the sucrose will be co-transported with those hydrogen ions via the protein co-transporters. And that is how we get the sucrose into the sieve tube element. Once it's in the sieve tube element, that is now going to be decreasing the water potential. And as a result, water from the xylem will move into the phloem by osmosis. That will increase the hydrostatic pressure at this end of the sieve tube element. At the same time, sucrose is being used in respiration at the sink, or it might be stored as insoluble starch. That means that more sucrose is going to be actively transported into the sink cell, which causes the water potential to decrease at this end. And as a result, water will move from the sieve tube element back into the xylem. So this means that at this end of the sieve tube element, we have a much lower hydrostatic pressure. So as a result, we've got a high pressure, a low pressure, we'll have the movement of solutes down that pressure gradient, and that is what causes the solution to move through the flow. And that takes us to the end of module three. I hope you found this helpful. If you did, make sure you give it a thumbs up and stick around for all of my remaining entire topic videos.